12. Waking at early dawn, Lavin tried to rouse his companions. Fazenga, lying prone with one stocking leg outstretched, was sleeping so soundly that it was impossible to get any answer out of him. Oblonsky, half asleep, refused to budge so early. Even Laska, sleeping curled into a ring on a corner of the hay heap, got up reluctantly and lazily stretched and adjusted first one hind leg and then the other. Having put on his boots, taken his gun and carefully opened the creaking barn doors, Lavin went out into the street. The coachmen were asleep beside the vehicles. The horses were drowsing. Only one of them was lazily eating oats, scattering them over the edge of the trough. The outside world was still grey. Why have you risen so early, my dear? said his aged hostess, who came out of her hut, addressing him cordially as a good old acquaintance. Why, I'm off shooting, Granny. Can I get to the marsh this way? Straight along at the back of the huts, past our thrashing floors, my dear, and then through the hemp field. There's a path. Carefully stepping with her bare, sunburned feet, the old woman showed him the way and lifted for him one of the bars enclosing the thrashing floor. Go straight on and you'll step right into the marsh. Our lads took the horses that way last night. Laska ran ahead gaily along the footpath, and Lavin followed at a brisk pace, continually glancing at the sky. He did not wish the sun to rise before he reached the marsh. But the sun did not tarry. The moon, which was still giving light when first he went out, now shone only like quicksilver. The streak of dawn, previously so noticeable, now had to be looked for. What had been vague spots on the distant field were now clearly visible. They were shocks of her eye. Still invisible in the absence of the sun, the dew on the tall, scented hemp, from which the male plants had already been weeded out, wetted Lavin's legs, and his blouse to above his belt. In the translucent stillness of the morning, the slightest sounds were audible. A bee flew past his ear, whistling like a bullet. He looked close and saw another, and a third. They all came from behind the wall of fence of an apiary, and flying across the hemp field disappeared in the direction of the marsh. The path led him straight to the marsh, which was recognisable by the mist rising from it, thicker at one spot and thinner at another, so that the sedge and willow bushes looked like islets swaying in the mist. At the edge of the marsh, the peasant boys and men who had pastured their horses in the night lay, covered with their coats, having fallen asleep at daybreak. Not far from them, three hobbled horses were moving about. One of them clattered its shackles. Laska walked beside her master, seeking permission to run forward and looking around. When he had passed the sleeping peasants and reached the first wet place, Levin examined his percussion caps and allowed Laska to go. One of the horses, a well-fed three-year-old chestnut, on seeing the dog, started, lifted his tail and snorted. The other horses, also alarmed, splashed through the water with their hobbled feet, making a sound of slapping as they drew their hoofs out of the thick clayey mud and began floundering their way out of the marsh. Laska paused with a mocking look at the horses and a questioning one at Levin. He stroked her and whistled as a sign that she might now set off. Joyful and preoccupied, Laska started running across the bog, which swayed beneath her feet. On entering the marsh, Laska had once perceived, mingled with the various familiar smells of roots, marsh, grass and rust, and with the unfamiliar smell of horse dung, the scent of the birds, those strong-smelling birds that excited her most, spreading all over the place. Here and there among the marsh, mosses and docks. That smell was very strong, but it was impossible to decide in which direction it grew stronger or weaker. To find this out, it was necessary to go further away in the direction of the wind. Hardly aware of her legs under her, Laska ran at a strained gallop, which she could cut short at a bound should occasion arise. To the right, away from the morning breeze which blew from the east, and then turned to windward. After inhaling the air with distended nostrils, she knew at once that not their scent only, but they themselves were there, before her, not one only, but many of them. She slackened speed. They were there, but she could not yet determine exactly where. To decide this, she began working round in a circle, when her master's voice disturbed her. Laska, here! 
he said, pointing to the other side. She stood still, as if asking him whether it would not be better to continue as she had begun. But he repeated his command in a stern voice, pointing to a group of hummocks covered with water where there could not be anything. She obeyed, pretending to search in order to please him, went over the whole place and then returned to the first spot, and immediately sent to them once more. Now that he was not hindering her, she knew what to do. And without looking where she was stepping, stumbling over hummocks and getting into the water, but surmounting the obstacles with her flexible strong legs, she began the circle which was to make everything clear. Their sound came to her more and more pungently, more and more distinctly, and all at once it became quite clear to her that one of them was there, behind a hummock, five steps in front. She stopped and her whole body grew rigid. The shortness of her legs prevented her seeing anything before her, but from the scent she could tell that it was not five paces off. She stood, more and more conscious of its presence and enjoying the anticipation. Her rigid tail was outstretched, only its very tip twitching. Her mouth was slightly open and her ears erect. One of her ears had turned back while she ran. She breathed heavily but cautiously, and yet more cautiously looked toward her master, turning her eyes rather than her head. He, with familiar face but ever terrible eyes, came stumbling over the hummocks, but unusually slow, she thought. So it seemed to her, though in reality he was running. Noticing Laska's peculiar manner of searching, as lowering her body almost to the ground she appeared to be dragging her broad hind paws, he knew that she was pointing at Snipe. And while running up to her, he prayed inwardly for success, especially with the first bird. Having come close up to her, he looked beyond, and from his height saw with his eyes what she had found with her nose. In the space between the hummocks, at a distance of about a sachin, he could see his snipe. It sat with turned head, listening. Then, just spreading its wings slightly and falling them again, it vanished round a corner with an awkward backward jerk. Seize it! Seize it! shouted Levin, pushing Laska from behind. But I can't go, thought she. Where should I go to? From here I sent them, but if I go forward, I shall not know what I am doing, nor where they are, nor who they are. But now he pushed her with his knee, saying in an excited whisper, Seize it, Laska, seize it. Well, if he wishes it, I will, but I can no longer answer for anything, thought Laska, and rushed forward at full tilt between the hummocks. She now scented nothing more, but only saw and heard without understanding anything. With lusty cries and the sound of the beating of concave wings so peculiar to the great snipe, a bird rose, and, following the rapport of the gun, it fell heavily on its wide breast ten paces from the first spot into the wet bog. Another rose behind Levin without waiting to be disturbed by the dog. By the time Levin had turned toward it, it had already gone far, but a shot reached it. After flying some twenty feet, the second snipe rose at an acute angle, and then, turning round and round like a ball, fell heavily on a dry spot. Now, things will go right, thought Lavin, putting the warm, fat snipe into his bag. Eh, Laska, dear, will things go right? When having reloaded, Lavin went on again. The sun, though still invisible because of the clouds, had already risen. The moon had lost all her brilliancy and gleamed like a little cloud in the sky. Not a single star was any longer visible. The marsh grass that had glittered like silver in the dew was now golden. The rusty patches were like amber. The bluish grasses had turned yellowish-green. Marsh birds were busy in the dew-bespangled bushes that cast long shadows beside the brook. A hawk had woken up and was sitting on a haycock, turning its head from side to side and looking discontentedly at the marsh. Crows were flying to the fields and a barefooted boy was already driving the horses toward an old man who had got up from beneath his coat and sat scratching himself. The powder smoke spread like milk over the green grass. A boy ran up to Levin. Uncle, there were ducks here yesterday, he shouted, following Levin from afar. And Levin felt increased pleasure in killing three snipe one after another within sight of this little boy, who expressed his approval. 13. The sportsman's saying that if you don't miss your first beast or first bird, your day will be successful, was justified. Tired, hungry and happy, Lavin returned to his lodging toward ten o'clock, 
having tramped some thirty versts, and bringing nineteen red-flashed birds, besides a dog tied to his girdle, as there was no room for it in his bag. His comrades had wakened long before, and had had time to get hungry and have their breakfast. "'Wait a bit, wait a bit. I know there are nineteen, said Levin, for a second time, counting a snipe and great snipe, which no longer had the important appearance they bore when on the wing, but were twisted, dried up, smeared with congealed blood, and had heads bent to one side. The tale was correct, and Oblonsky's envy gratified Levin. He was also pleased that on his return he found a messenger had already arrived from Kitty with a note. I'm quite well and happy. If you were uneasy about me, you may be quite at ease now. I have a new bodyguard. Mary Vlasyevna. This was the midwife, a new and important personage in the Levins' family life. She has come to see me and finds me perfectly well, and we've got her to stay till your return. All are cheerful and well, so don't hurry, and even stay another day if your sport is good. These two joys, his successful shooting and the news from his wife, were so great that two small unpleasantnesses which occurred after the shooting were easy to disregard. One was that the chestnut side horse, having evidently been overworked the previous day, was off its feed and seemed dull. The coachman said it had been strained. It was overdriven yesterday, Konstantin Dmitrich, he said. Why, it was driven hard for ten versts. The other unpleasantness, which for a moment upset his good humour, but about which he afterwards laughed heartily, was that of all the provisions that Kitty had provided so lavishly that it had appeared impossible to eat them up in a week, nothing was left. Returning tired and hungry from his sport, Lavin so vividly anticipated the pies that on approaching his lodging he seemed to smell and taste them, just as Laska scented game, and he immediately ordered Philip to serve them. It turned out that there were no pies, nor even any chickens left. He has an appetite, said Oblonsky, laughing and pointing to Vazanka Veslovsky. I don't suffer from lack of appetite, but he's quite surprising. Well, it can't be helped, said Levin, looking morosely at Veslovsky. Well, then bring me some beef, Philip. The beef has been eaten and the bone was given to the dogs, answered Philip. Levin was so annoyed that he said crossly, Something might have been left for me and he felt inclined to cry. Well then, draw the birds and stuff them with nettles, said he in a trembling voice to Philip, trying not to look at Veslovsky. And ask at least for some milk for me. Later on, when he had satisfied his hunger with the milk, he felt ashamed of having shown annoyance to a stranger, and he began laughing at his hungry irritation. In the evening, they again went out shooting, when Veslovsky also killed some birds, and late at night they set off home. The drive back was as merry as the drive out had been. Veslovsky now sang, now recalled with relish his adventures with the peasants, who entertained him with vodka and said, No offence. And now his night exploits with Hazelnuts, the maid servant, and the peasant, who asked him whether he was married, and learning that he was not, said, Don't hanker after other men's wives, but above all things, strive to get one of your own. These words particularly amused Veslovsky. Altogether, I'm awfully pleased with our outing. And you, Levin? I'm very pleased with it too, said Levin sincerely. He was glad not only to feel no hostility such as he had felt at home toward Vazenka Veslovsky, but on the contrary, to feel quite friendly toward him. 14. Next morning at ten o'clock, Levin, having made the round of his farm, knocked at the door of Vazenka's room. Entrez, shouted Veslovsky. Excuse me, I've only just finished my ablutions, he said, smiling, as he stood before Levin in his underclothes. Please don't mind me, and Levin sat down by the window. Have you slept well? Like the dead. What a day it is for shooting. What do you drink, tea or coffee? Neither. Nothing before lunch. I am really quite ashamed. I expect the ladies are already up. It will be fine to go for a walk now. You must show me your horses. When they had walked round the garden, visited the stables, and even done some gymnastics together on the parallel bars, Lavin returned to the house with his guest and entered the drawing room with him. We had fine sport and so many new impressions, 
said Veslovsky, approaching Kitty, who sat at the samovar. What a pity ladies are deprived of that pleasure. Well, what of it? He must say something to the mistress of the house, Levin told himself. He again thought he noticed something in this smile and conquering air with which the visitor addressed Kitty. The princess, who sat at the other end of the table with Mary Vlasyevna and Oblonsky, called Levin and began a conversation about moving to Moscow for Kitty's confinement and taking a house there. Just as all the preparations for the wedding had been disagreeable to him, since they detracted by their insignificance from the majesty of what was taking place, so now the preparations for the coming birth, the time of which they were reckoning on their fingers, appeared to him yet more offensive. He always tried not to hear those conversations about the best way of swaddling the future infant, tried to turn away and not see those mysterious endless knitted binders and three-cornered pieces of linen to which Dolly attached special importance, and all the rest. The birth of a son, he was certain it would be a son, which they promised him, but in which he still could not believe. So extraordinary did it seem. It appeared to him on the one hand such an immense and therefore impossible happiness, and on the other such a mysterious event, that this pretended knowledge of what was going to happen, and consequent preparations as for something ordinary, something produced by human beings, seemed to him an indignity and a degradation. But the princess did not understand his feelings, and attributed his unwillingness to think and speak about it to thoughtlessness and indifference, and therefore gave him no peace. She was now commissioning Oblonsky to see about a house, and called Levin to her. "'I don't know at all, princess. Do as you think best,' he said. "'You must decide when you will move. "'I really don't know. I know that millions of children are born without Moscow and without doctors. "'Then why—' "'Well, if that's—' Oh, no, just as Kitty likes. But one can't talk to Kitty about it. Why, do you want me to frighten her? You know, only this spring Natalie Golitsyn died because she had a bad doctor. I will do whatever you tell me to, he replied morosely. The princess began telling him, but he did not listen to her. Though this talk with the princess upset him, it was not that, but what he saw by the samovar which made him morose. No, this is impossible, he thought, glancing occasionally at Vazenka, who was leaning toward Kitty and saying something, with his handsome smile, and at Kitty, blushing and agitated. There was something impure in Vazenka's attitude, his look and his smile. Levin even saw something impure in Kitty's pose and smile, and again the light faded from his eyes. Again, as on the previous occasion, he suddenly, without the least interval, felt thrown from the height of happiness, peace and dignity, into an abyss of despair, malevolence and degradation. Again everyone and everything became revolting to him. Well then, princess, let it be just as you think best, he said, turning away. Heavy is the autocrat's crown, said Oblonsky banteringly, evidently alluding not only to the princess's conversation, but also to the cause of Levin's agitation, which he had observed. How late you are today, Dolly? They all rose to greet Dolly. Fazenga only rose for a moment, and with the absence of politeness to women, which is characteristic of modern young men, barely bowed and again continued his conversation, laughing at something. Masha has worn me out. She slept badly and is terribly capricious this morning, said Dolly. The conversation with Kitty, begun by Fazenga, again dealt with Anna and with the question whether love can rise above social conditions. This conversation was unpleasant to Kitty and upset her, both by the subject itself and by the tone in which it was carried on, but especially because she already knew the effect it would have on her husband. But she was too simple and innocent to know how to stop it, or even how to conceal the superficial pleasure which this young man's evident attentions caused her. She wished to put an end to the conversation, but did not know how. Whatever she did, she knew, would be noticed by her husband, and would all be construed into something wrong. And really, when she asked Dolly what was the matter with Masha, and Vazenka, waiting for this uninteresting conversation to finish, gazed indifferently at Dolly, her question seemed to Levin a piece of unnatural and disgusting cunning. Well, shall we go to pick mushrooms today? said Dolly. Yes, please, and I will go too, said Kitty, and blushed. She had been going, out of politeness, to ask Vazenka whether he would go with him but refrained. 
Where are you going, Kostya? She asked her husband with a guilty look as he passed by with the resolute steps. His guilty look confirmed all his suspicions. The mechanic arrived during my absence, and I have not yet seen him, he answered, without looking at her. He went downstairs, but had not had time to leave his study before he heard his wife's familiar footsteps, following him with imprudent rapidity. What is it? he asked dryly. We're busy. Excuse me, she said, addressing the German mechanic. I have a few words to say to my husband. The German was about to go out, but Levin said to him, Don't trouble. The train's at three? asked the German. I must not miss it. Levin did not answer him, but went out with his wife. Well, what have you to say to me? he asked in French. He did not look her in the face and did not notice that she, in her condition, stood with her whole face twitching and had a pitiful, crushed appearance. I... I want to tell you that it's impossible to live like this. It's torture, she muttered. The servants are there in the pantry, he said angrily. Don't make a scene. Well then, come here. They were in a passage, and Kitty wished to enter the next room. But the English governess was there, giving Tanya a lesson. Well, come into the garden. In the garden they came upon a man weeding a path, and without any longer considering that the man saw her tear-stained eyes and his excited face, or that they looked like people running away from some calamity, they went on with rapid feet, feeling that they must speak out and convince each other, must be alone together, and thereby both escape from the torment both were experiencing. One can't live like this. It is torture. I suffer and you suffer. Why? she asked, when they'd at last reached a secluded seat at the corner of the Lime Tree Avenue. Only tell me this. Was there something improper, impure, degradingly horrid in his tone, he said, standing in front of her in the same attitude as on that night, with fists pressing his chest. There was, she said in a trembling voice. But Kostya, do you really not see that I am not to blame? From the time I came down I wanted to adopt a tone. But these people... Why did he come? How happy we were, she said choking with sobs that shook the whole of her expanded body. The gardener saw with surprise that, though nothing had been pursuing them, and there had been nothing to run away from, and they could not have found anything very blissful in that seat, they passed him on the way back to the house, with quieted and beaming faces. Fifteen. After seeing his wife upstairs, Levin went to Dolly's part of the house. She too was in great trouble that day. She was walking up and down the room and speaking angrily to a little girl who stood howling in a corner. You'll stand in that corner all day and we'll have your dinner alone, and you will not see a single doll, and I won't have a new frog made for you, she was saying, unable to think of any more punishments for the child. Ah, oh, she's a horrid child, she cried, addressing Levin. Where do these vile tendencies in her come from? But what has she done? asked Lavin rather indifferently. He wanted to consult her about his own affairs and was annoyed at having come at an inopportune moment. She and Grisha went away among the raspberry canes and there... I can't even tell what she did. One regrets Miss Elliot a thousand times. This one does not look after the children. She's only a machine. Figurez-vous que la petite... Dola told Marsha's crime. That proves nothing. It is not a bad tenancy, but just mischievousness, Levin comforted her. But you are upset about something. Why have you come? asked Dolly. What's happening there? And by the tone of her question, Levin knew that it would be easy for him to tell her what he meant to say. I was not there, but I have been in the garden alone with Kitty. We have quarrelled for the second time since Steva's arrival. Dolly gazed at him with wise, comprehending eyes. Well, tell me, hand on heart, was there, not on Kitty's side, but on that gentleman's, a tone which might be unpleasant? Not unpleasant, but terrible and offensive to a husband. 
That is to say, how am I to put it? Stop! Stop in the corner, she said, turning to Masha, who, noticing a scarcely perceptible smile on her mother's face, was turning round. The world would say he has behaved as all young men behave. He pays court to a young and pretty woman, and a society husband should be merely flattered by it. Yes, yes, answered Levin gloomily. But you noticed it? Not I only, but Steva too. He told me frankly after tea. I believe Aslovsky is courting Kitty a wee bit. Well, all right, now I am tranquil. I will turn him out, said Levin. What do you mean? Have you gone mad? exclaimed Dolly, terrified. What do you mean, Kostya? Consider, she went on, laughing. You can go to Fanny now, she said to Masha. No, if you like, I will tell Steva and he will take him away. One can say you are expecting visitors. Certainly, he does not suit your household. No, no, I'll do it myself. But you will quarrel. Not at all. It will be a pleasure for me. A real pleasure, said Levin with sparkling eyes. Come, forgive her, Dolly. She won't do it again, he pleaded, referring to the small culprit who had not gone to Fanny, but stood hesitatingly before her mother, looking up from under her brows, expecting and trying to catch her eye. Dolly looked at her. The little girl burst into sobs and buried her face in her mother's lap, and Dolly placed her thin tender hand on the child's head. What is there in common between us and him? thought Levin, as he went in search of Vaslovsky. Passing through the hall, he ordered the calash to be harnessed to drive to the station. One of the springs broke yesterday, replied the footman. Well then, the Tarantas, but make haste. Where is the visitor? He has gone to his room. Levin found Fazenka, who had unpacked his portmanteau and spread out his new songs, trying on a pair of leggings and preparing for a ride. Whether there was something unusual in Levin's face, or whether Vazanka himself felt that Le Petit Brin de Cour, which he had started, was out of place in this family, he was embarrassed, as far as permissible to a man's society, by Levin's entry. You wear leggings for riding? Yes, it's much cleaner, said Vazanka, placing his fat foot on a chair, fastening the bottom hook, and smiling good-naturedly. He was certainly a good-natured fellow, and Levin felt sorry for him and ashamed of himself as a host when he noticed the shyness of Vazenka's look. On the table lay a piece of stick, which when doing gymnastics that morning they had broken, trying to raise the warped parallel bars. Levin took the broken stick and began pulling off the splintered bits at the end, not knowing how to begin. I wished... He stopped, but suddenly remembering Kitty and all that had happened, he said, looking Veslovsky firmly in the eyes, I have ordered the horses to be harnessed for you. What do you mean? Fazenka began with surprise. To drive where? For you, to the station, answered Levin gloomily, pulling off splinters. Why, are you going away, or has anything happened? It happens that I am expecting visitors, replied Levin more rapidly, breaking off the splintered bits of the stick with his strong fingers. Or no, I am not expecting visitors, and nothing has happened, yet I request you to leave. You may explain my impoliteness as you please. Vazenka drew himself up. I ask you for an explanation, he said with dignity, having at last understood. I can't give you an explanation, said Levin softly and slowly, trying to control the trembling of his jaw, and it is better for you not to ask. As the splinters were now all broken off, Levin grasped the thick ends in his fingers and split the stick, carefully catching a piece as it fell. Probably the sight of those strained arms, those muscles he had felt that morning when doing gymnastics, and the gleaming eyes, low voice and trembling jaws, convinced Fazenka more than the words. He shrugged his shoulders, smiled contemptuously, and bowed. Can I not see Oblonsky? The shrug and smile did not irritate Levin. What else is there for him to do, he thought. I will send him to you at once. What is this nonsense, 
said Oblonsky, when he had heard from his friend that he was being driven out of the house, and had found Levin in the garden, where he was walking while awaiting the departure of his visitor. But it's ridiculous. What fly has stung you? But it's the height of absurdity. Why, do you imagine that every young man? But the place where the fly had stung Levin was evidently still sore, for he again grew pale when Oblonsky wished to refer to his reason, and hastily interrupted him. Please don't explain my reasons. I can't do otherwise. I feel ashamed before you and before him. But I don't think it will grieve him much to go away, and his present is unpleasant to me and to my wife. But he feels insulted, and besides, it's absurd. And I feel insulted and tortured, and I've done nothing wrong and don't deserve to suffer. Well, I never expected this of you. One may be jealous, but to such a point is the height of absurdity. Levin turned away from him quickly and went far down one of the avenues, where he continued walking up and down alone. Soon he heard the rattle of the tarantas, and through the trees saw Fazenka, seated on hay. Unluckily the tarantas had no seat, with a scotch bonnet on his head, jolting over the ruts as he was driven down the other avenue. What does that mean? One at Levin, when the footman ran out of the house and stopped the vehicle. It was on account of the mechanic, whom Levin had quite forgotten. He bowed and said something to Veslovsky, then climbed into the Tarantas, and they drove away together. Oblonsky and the princess were indignant at Levin's conduct. He himself felt not only that he was in the highest degree ridiculous, but quite guilty and disgraced. But recalling what he and his wife had suffered, and asking himself how he would act another time, he answered that he would do just the same again. In spite of all this, by the end of the day everyone, except the princess, who could not forgive Levin's conduct, became unusually animated and merry, like children after a punishment, or adults after an oppressive official reception. So that in the princess's absence they talked about Vazenka's expulsion as of an historic event. Dolly, who had inherited her father's gift of putting things humorously, made Varenka collapse with laughter when she related for the third or fourth time, with ever fresh humorous additions, how she was just putting on some new ribbons in the visitor's honour and was about to go into the drawing room, when suddenly she heard the clatter of the old cart. And who was inside the cart? Who but Fazenka, with his scotch bonnet and his songs and his laggings, sitting on the hay? At least you might have let him have the brougham. And then I hear, Stop! Well, I think I, they've relented. I look again, and they popped a fat German in with them, and were driving them both off. And so my ribbons were all in vain.'